I thought I'd uh, talk about uh, less my previous uh, interest in DTI and uh, maybe more about the future and you know what we're trying to develop in the Child Health Institute that maybe one day will be clinically available. Uh, this field of microstructure imaging has been evolving kind of organically in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, people who've been interested in uh, looking at microstructural details and microstructural features, architectural organization, particularly in the brain, uh, have been applying, developing uh, porous media NMR concepts uh, to looking at uh, tissue. And we've, you know, been uh, very involved in that. And I'll show you a couple of examples of that from my lab uh, that I illustrate this uh, interest and maybe suggest some of the clinical potential. So uh, this is the only slide that you're going to see about uh, diffusion tensor imaging. But uh, DTI, in some sense, uh, which we developed, really invented and developed more than 24 years ago, uh, the pipeline for this technology really hasn't changed much uh, since we first proposed it. Uh, and the idea here is to obtain uh, invariant microstructural features of the tissue that were really previously unavailable. So you start with uh, images, a multiplicity of them that are sensitized to the direction and, uh, of, of water diffusion. Uh, displacements of water molecules in the brain uh, and then you use a model uh, to estimate a, a three by three positive uh, definite diffusion tensor and the elements are shown here as black uh, being uh, uh, you know uh, negative and, and, and white being positive, but these are these are quantitative estimates of diffusion tensor elements, diagonal elements, off-diagonal el elements, and from that you can produce maps of the principal diffusivities, the three eigenvalues of the diffusion tensor in each voxel, the principal uh, axes or eigenvectors uh, associated with them, and then you can produce these stains or uh, maps that are intrinsic to the tissue, they're rotationally invariant, uh, one of them that's probably the most widely used, the mean ADC, is um, uh, used in, in stroke where that value can drop 30, 40, sometimes 50 percent when somebody has a cerebral ischemia and it's a very good way of identifying where that region is. The fractional anisotropy, I don't know how clearly you see that. Is it possible to turn the light off at least just right over here near me? Just so there's a little bit more. Okay. So this this uh, fractional anisotropy map indicates the amount of prolateness uh, or oblateness of the diffusion ellipsoid, and is a very good indicator of where white matter in the brain can be found, which which is. Uh, in which diffusion is highly anisotropic as opposed to gray matter or the cerebral spinal fluid which uh, exhibit isotropic diffusion. This deck map is something my colleague Carlo Pierpali and Sini Pajevich developed that colors the FA according to the direction or orientation that the fibers run. So in this case red, red indicates left right and you know uh, yellow or green uh, indicates up down. Uh, you can also obtain diffusion ellipsoids in each voxel and uh, if you follow the direction of maximum diffusivity like uh, you would in fluid mechanics follow uh, the velocity distribution you can get um, these streamlined representations of fiber pathways and this is being used a lot uh, to uh, establish the anatomical basis of functional connectivity you know, in the brain. But a problem that we've been focusing on for a number of years has been to take these uh, sort of featureless diffusion weighted images that are obtained at about uh, one millimeter by one millimeter by one millimeter in voxel size and to see if we can drill down into the voxel and obtain microstructural information that a neuroanatomist or a neuropathologist would want to know. 
So for instance, uh, myelin thickness, axon diameter, axon diameter distribution, cell size, cell orientation, um, you know, extracellular fraction. So one possible way of doing this is to just continue to increase the magnetic field strength and to try to make your voxels smaller and smaller. But we know that at about a million dollars a Tesla, that uh, is a difficult proposition and an expensive one. And uh, uh, I think a cleverer approach is to use a multiplicity of these low resolution MRI uh, data that's obtained with diffusion weighting and to use models and methods that you know, from mathematical physics to try to infer some of the microstructural features of, of the tissue, the morphology, architecture, organization. And these are, you know, the candidate um, quantities that we're trying to estimate or measure. Cell size, cell size distribution, extracellular matrix fraction. These are the kinds of things that a neuropathologist might look at, for instance, in making a determination or grading, staging cancers. Uh, so the way that diffusion weighted imaging works is that you take a conventional spin echo, Hans spin echo, with a 90 degree RF pulse followed by a 180 degree RF pulse and you add to it uh, two uh, gradients that sensitize this uh, signal to the net displacement of uh, the spin-labeled species that you're tracking. So if you, and, and a quantity that we very often like to use that was, I think it was introduced by Callahan, but it may have been introduced by others, is, is Q. This is the degree of diffusion weighting. This tells you uh, the, the essentially the length scale over which you're probing the displacements. So if you're a spin, a water molecule, uh, you, uh, a, you get a phase shift be, with the addition of the first gradient. Uh, if you're a stationary spin, uh, this 180 degree pulse will just flip this uh, phase, uh, negate it, and then the, the application of the next uh, gradient pulse will bring the phase back to the original position and the signal will not have changed. All the phases will have been refocused, they'll all be coincident and there won't be any reduction in the overall signal. But a, a, a spin that's moving during the course of the experiment will experience a different phase history. So it'll start with the 90 degree pulse. It will uh, obtain a phase shift because of this gradient pulse. Uh, that phase shift will be negated by the 180. But when the next gradient pulse is applied, it won't completely offset or cancel the, appli the application of the first pulse, and there'll be a phase offset. And when you have billions and billions of these uh, spins in, in the control volume or the voxel, the signal attenuation will be given by the sum of the phases, essentially, a vector sum. So what will happen is that, let's see if I can see if this thing actually gets, gets smaller. I think that, now, anyway. And so what happens is, as the, as the phase distribution is broad, the signal will continually get smaller and smaller. Uh, so this is really how diffusion weighting works. Uh, so what we're trying to do is, is use diffusion weighting to probe dimensions within the voxel that are much smaller than the voxel size. We said the voxel size was about one millimeter cubed. Water diffuses about five um, microns in the order of about a, a 50 millisecond you know, experiment. So if we're able to follow the displacement of water within the voxel, uh, we can probe the shape, the confining structures that water is uh, you know, being subjected to using this approach. And we do this using both the conventional diffusion weighted uh, sequence that I just showed you, the stetch call tanner sequence, and variants of it. This is one in particular called the double pulse field gradient experiment. You basically concatenate this one um, with itself or a facsimile of it, and you, you basically get a, 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 a double PFG sequence which is sensitive to the correlation of the displacements that occur 
during uh, the history of, of the SPIN system. So, and I would say in the last 10 years, uh, we've developed mathematical and physical frameworks to be able to really look at these cell shape, cell size, cell size distribution, uh, even you know cell orientation, not just DTI, but other models have been developed to look at, at orientation of, of um, particularly of white matter structures. So the first uh, microstructural imaging method that I'm going to discuss is based on re really early work from uh, Stechkal. Uh, he proposed this relationship between the signal attenuation that we measure, the echo that we saw in the previous experiment, and this uh, displacement distribution. This is the probability that a spin goes from uh, you know, position R0 to R in a diffusion time capital delta. Uh, and uh, this is a Fourier transform relationship between this and that. And this is very powerful because this isn't a really model dependent. We're not saying what diffusion process we're observing. We're just saying that if we measure this uh, under a variety of conditions at different values of, of G and uh, with gradients uh, applied along different directions, we can uh, estimate this quantity here by an inverse 3D Fourier transform. Now, uh, Paul Callahan combined this nuclear magnetic resonance methodology with MRI with his um, colleagues uh, back at, in, in Massey University back in 1988. This is not a well-cited paper, but it really represents a foundational development in our field. What, what he did is he took the, um, the diffusion experiment of Stetch, Colin, Tanner and embedded it into an MRI experiment where he would be able to make this measurement on a voxel by voxel basis. Uh, now, why am I interested in this? Well, I view this kind of average propagator imaging as one of the holy grails of MRI, of diffusion MRI. So one thing, it's model free. We're not assuming Gaussian diffusion or a particular type of para parametric distribution. It turns out that w I showed back, you know, about 13 years ago that, uh, that this average propagator imaging subsumes DTI. So if you're able to measure the ap average propagator, you get DTI for free. Uh, it yields new features. Uh, an orientational distribution. This is uh, something that Wadeen had proposed originally. Uh, moments of the PDF, so means, variances, skewnesses, kurtosis, so those kinds of imaging techniques are becoming more prevalent now. And it also allows you to, to get more of these stains like the FA and the and the average diffusivity that I showed earlier. You can look at time-dependent diffusion with this approach by varying the diffusion time, and you can get information about pore size, shape, orientation from this approach. And then if you're looking at these distributions in each voxel, you can start to use this from an image processing perspective to segment, classify, cluster different tissues, differentiating, let's say, healthy from affected, or uh, cerebrospinal fluid from gray matter, from white matter. Uh, and, and can aid you in, in registration and atlasing applications. Now, one of the problems with Callahan's approach and D DSI, the approach that was proposed uh, uh, by, by Wadeen at the Martino Center, is that it's a brute force three-dimensional FFT relating the displacement distribution to the signal attenuation. And, you know, if, if you want to have, let's say, 32 Q values in the X direction and 32 Q values in the Y direction and say 16 Q values in the Z direction, you're talking about you know, 32,000 uh, diffusion weighted images that you need in order to get a high resolution reconstruction. So this is completely impractical clinically and we, we recognize this very early on and I tried a few different strategies to uh, obtain the 
this propagator with a vastly reduced amount of data, essentially trying to compress the acquisition. But Evernote Sarslan really, I think, uh, created a, a very powerful framework for doing this, um, which, which we now call MAP, or Mean Apparent Propagator MRI. So what he did is he, he started uh, from the, the Hamilt you know, Hamiltonian, the description of the simple harmonic oscillator in quantum mechanics, and looked at the form of the Hermite functions that are used to describe the, the wave function uh, of, the, um, uh, of this, the solution. And these have very beautiful properties that are well suited for this kind of reconstruction. And then the ansatz that he made was that uh, the signal that we measure in the NMR experiment uh, could be written as a linear combination of these uh, Hermite functions. Now the Hermite functions are complete orthogonal basis. Uh, the first term is a Gaussian, which is what we always find in uh, these experiments, so it, it, it behaves properly in, in the limiting con What's <laughs> Ignore that, okay. Uh, it behaves properly in, the, in all the, the right limiting conditions. And the only thing we really need to do in this problem is measure the ANs. Also because of the conjugate kind of dual relationship between uh, these um, basis functions when you go from the measurement space to the probability space, you don't have to do a numerical FFT. You can immediately get the result because uh, the basis functions are the same in both uh, uh, coordinate systems. So what does this produce? Well, uh, this is an experiment that, that was done, a MAP experiment that was done in uh, monkey brain. Uh, this is the conventional DTI that I said that you get for free. You get the signal intensity, the color mapping, the fractional anisotropy that shows you where the white matter is, the mean diffusivity. You can get parallel and perpendicular diffusivities, lambda parallel and lambda perpendicular. But you also get these new stains that are informative. The RTOP, the return to origin probability, we can show is a, is a measure one over the pore volume. So if water is trapped in cells, let's say axons, in the intra-axonal space, we can use this to, to make an estimate or measurement of the size of that pore. Uh, this NG quantity is the non-Gaussianity. This is the power in the probability distribution that isn't described by the Gaussian DTI model. And we know that when water is trapped in compartments or it's not freely able to diffuse, it will uh, uh, deviate from a Gaussian diffusion model. And this propagator anisotropy is a more general form of the FA. So it, it takes into account the anisotropic part of the propagator beyond what the DTI uh, anisotropy measures. Uh, so this is... Uh, is there any displacement due to the magnetic field? I mean, I know water is weakly like magnetic. At, at the micron resolution you're talking about, the like movements of the water just from the external magnetic field? In the magnetic field? Right. Uh, well, we're not aware that, that the magnetic field is, is producing any changes in water motion. Um, is that what you're, you, you, are yeah, you talking about induced that. streaming or something like that? I mean, I know that there's no microscopic effect, but you're talking about measuring micron size space. W well, we're, we're looking at, a, at, at an average over a voxel of, you know, billions and billions and billions of individual water but molecules. It is. So was any kind of displacement by a micron for all the voxels? So, so I'm not aware of, and maybe, maybe somebody can correct me, I'm not aware of any kind of bulk flow or um, kind of tissue-based uh, streaming or flow that's induced or produced by the application of a constant magnetic field, or even with water not being, you know, charged, that even gradients or, you know, induced electric fields might produce. But um, I don't know, has somebody looked into that? Does, is there, I, 
I mean, I'm not aware of any evidence for that, some kind of streaming that's induced by the application of a static magnetic field. Uh, this is uh, the drawing by Ramoni Cajal of the, of the hippocampus of a human, and this is um, a representation of the same structure that was excised from a human. Um, it's a little bit maybe because of the re resolution of the of the projector but you can see at least with these insets different parts of the hippocampus are known to have very different structures they have there's a very well defined layered structure there are nuclei there are areas where there's well defined white matter here you have these uh, mean displacement profiles that, that show a, a uniform direction they're very skinny and they look you know, well defined. These are white matter areas, and then there are complex areas where there are mossy fibers and very complex microstructure. So you can see that the, this kind of displacement map is starting to recapitulate some of the microstructure that we know from, uh, you know, even from the Ra Ramoni Cajal uh, drawings that, that were done. Are these in your, public, in your paper you just referenced? Um, you know, I don't know whether whether this this was in the the macaque paper. I don't. I, I think this was this is maybe internal. Okay. This was done with um, Tim Shepard from uh, NYU. At that time, it was Florida State University. So Everin uh, looked at fiber crossing areas in the marmoset brain. Um, this was a model system that we had good access to. Uh, in, in our lab uh, in association with uh, um, Afonso Silva and NINDS. And these are areas, known areas of crossing fibers. Uh, I think the corona radiata um, and internal capsule. You can see very well defined um, kind of stick-like projections and then you can see areas where these there clearly are two sticks. These are indicative of crossing fibers in complex white matter areas. Uh, one of the questions that you have to ask since we're in a, at the NIH and we're, we're developing methods that eventually can be used clinically is whether these kind of acquisitions are consistent with ever being used on a clinical magnet. So Everin considered uh, a vastly reduced experimental design where he not only uh, reduce the gradients that were being applied to those that were achievable on clinical systems, but 55 data points from the almost 500 um, would allow a sequence like this to be applied, you know, in about 10 minutes. And he showed that some of these new stains, the, the propagator anisotropy, the non-Gaussianity, the return to origin probability, were not too far off from what we had obtained with a higher quality data acquisition. So the, this already suggested um, back a few years ago that this was clinically viable. And recently in my group, Alexandru Avram has actually done a clinical implementation of this um, on a GE750 in about uh, 10 or 12 minutes showing all of the map parameters, the return to origin probability and the return to axis probability, the fractional anisotropy, propagator anisotropy, the color map that we get from DTI, the non-Gaussianity. So we're, we're in a position now where we can really translate this, where we can apply it first with normal subjects and eventually to see if we can identify changes that occur during development, aging, degeneration, traumatic brain injury. These give us a, a larger panel of stains that we can use to look for changes that may occur. Um, and this, this is a, you know, an, a display of some of these orientation distribution functions, these mean squared displacement distributions that tell you uh, whether they're, they suggest whether they're crossing fibers or multiple fiber populations. Um, in DTI, you don't see that, but in, in, these, um, in these model free approaches, you, you can. Question? So, um, this is not directly related to the kind of feasibility, but it has to do with uh, these remapping studies. So, how consistent is it if you just go a year later, a month later, and get a patient? How consistent are the maps? Well, we we've with with others we haven't published this yet, but uh, we've acquired a, a very extensive data set. They call this test retest, 
where you basically take the same subject and you scan them over and over and over again. Uh, and the reproducibility is very high. I mean, with the following caveats, you can't always position the person exactly in the same place. And um, there may be some movement during the study. But if you take all the data and you warp it to a common template, um, and then you essentially analyze the data in aggregate, um, you get extremely high quality results. So, and you can also look at the variation of, of all of the different parameters over uh, for, you know, for each experiment and you can see what the, um, even what the biological and what the uh, instrument, instrumental variabilities are. Uh, the reason I ask is that there have been several studies looking at uh, changes in learning uh, of one form or another. Right. For large fiber levels. And so it was kind of intriguing and suggested that you might have remodeling or change in myelination. Well, there have been functional studies that have, you know, this need for speed uh, uh, paper by Asaf and others uh, also suggested that training can affect that plasticity. Right, right. So, yeah, you try training or something like that and change the brain matter, also the white matter. So, so I'm just curious whether you have any comments on um, the believability of these results based on what you know about. Well, th this is the reproducibility of another technique that they're not using. I mean, they're, they're not using MAP MRI. Um, and, th you know, they're also not doing all the corrections that we're doing to try to, you know, get rid of all of the artifacts, uh, eddy currents, susceptibility, EPI distortion, and all the other things that we know are there. So I, I can't talk about other people's data and the amount of reproducibility there, there is, but it's, it tends to be very high in the way we're doing the DTI and the MAP now because we're controlling for all of those uh, systematic artifacts that creep into the analysis. So people's brains, you know, normal brains aren't changing that much from scan to scan. Uh, here, here, an uh, example of the uh, of an ODF uh, orientation distribution uh, function, and these areas that are bright here are areas where there's high fractional anisotropy. You can see some of these stick figures suggesting suggestive of white matter pathways that are fairly coherent, and then you can see these gray matter like areas where there, you know, multiple crossings. Um, you know, and, and a very kind of complex microarchitecture. All right, so one of my goals, you know, that I've been working toward has been to try to do a kind of cytoarchitectonic uh, parcellation based on these and other features, and uh, also to be able to not only find the areas, but also go drill down into the cortex and to try to see different layers where there are different architectural paradigms. And we've made a little progress in that direction. We're starting to, and this is macaque brain, you can start to see, um, you know, when you move along the cortex, here's subcortical white matter. It's very cle clean and clear. You see the, uh, you know, kind of single, almost toothpick-like orientation distributions here. And then you see, you know, cortical layers. We have about four or five or six of these uh, displacement distributions that are visualized here. And you can see that in different parts of the cortex you have different kinds of shapes. And we're play, you know, trying to figure out ways to use these different di distributions to cluster and, and segment uh, different cortical areas. Um, here's a, an, another kind of higher resolution representation. You can see these white areas are subcortical white matter. These are U fibers. And you can see, you know, significant differences qualitatively just by eye uh, of these displacement distributions in different cortical areas. Now, there are some limitations of the average propagator. Um, one of them is that uh, you can't use it to look at what's called local anisotropy. Um, when you have little sticks, molecules, microtubules, tubes, that are randomly oriented, individually those structures are anisotropic, but in a whole volume or voxel, because of their random orientation, uh, that anisotropy gets averaged out. 
And this methodology doesn't drill down deep enough to be able to see that microscopic anisotropy. Um, it's also not that well suited for looking at exchange and looking at even at multiple compartments that might be within the same voxel. So, uh, and another thing that I wanted to mention is that uh, the, this average propagator method, uh, the K and Q space or DSI type approaches, require the use of very strong magnetic field gradients to produce enough of the diffusion signal attenuation to be able to see, see stuff. So this is what I was referring to before. When you have uh, an MRI pixel that contains a lot of uh, dendritic ar arborization and fibers and things uh, that are individually uh, anisotropic, these get averaged up and they, they produce an isotropic or uniform uh, distribution uh, at the voxel level. But if you have a macroscopic organization, uh, that will produce an anisotropic displacement diffusion. That's what DTI really effectively measures. But we're, we're interested in this. So we, we constructed a, a, um, a, a gray matter phantom that consisted of, you know, to begin with, a bunch of randomly oriented glass uh, tubes filled with uh, dichlorobenzene and, um, or with water in a dichlorobenzene solution. And we uh, were able to, you know, using approaches that were developed actually originally in Paul Callahan's lab, we were able to use this double pulse field gradient experiment to show that there was a, a difference between the signal attenuations uh, along the um, parallel axes X, Y, and Z and, uh, and along the orthogonal axes X, Y, X, Z, uh, Y, Z, which is a kind of a hallmark or signature of this microscopic anisotropy. So we're also planning to use this as a kind of stain or a method for looking at this uh, gray matter microstructure. Uh, another way that I, I told you you can probe microstructure with the average propagator is by changing the diffusion time. Now um, this is particularly interesting in, in complex uh, tissues like we believe white matter that have uh, a hierarchical type organization. So if you look at white matter from an anatomical you know, cross section from a whole brain and you look at a pyramidal tract or you know, a big pathway, um, you'll, you'll see these gigantic bundles of, of fibers and when you look at them at a higher magnification you'll see that those are made up of, of big fascicles that individually contain axons that contain, uh, you know, filaments and proteins that are also cylinders. So at about six or seven orders of magnitude, you have cylinders within cylinders within cylinders. And this is kind of typical of fractal type uh, uh, organized st structures. And, and it, there's a whole literature of diffusion in fractal media uh, which, which we've been able to tap into uh, in this way. So if you're looking at free diffusion, the mean squared displacement is uh, linearly proportional to the diffusion time. If you're looking at restricted diffusion, the mean squared displacement will rise until you reach the pore volume, at which point you can't move out anymore. So you're, ta you're, you're basically, you reach this plateau if, you, if you're looking at a, a system where you have, let's say, uh, glass spheres and you're diffusing in the extra sphere part of the medium, you're never really going to be able to explore all the space, but in order to go from one place to another, you have a more tortuous path, and this is called hindered diffusion, and it results in a quasi-Gaussian type behavior at long diffusion times, but uh, at, with diffusivities that appear to be lower than the free diffusivity of the solvent uh, or in which you're diffusing. But if you're um, looking at anomalous diffusion, it's sort of intermediate between free and hindered where the mean squared displacement keeps on increasing but it never catches up to being free and it never really flattens out. And typically the way that this is described is that the mean squared displacement is proportional to the diffusion time to some power alpha, which is less than one for subdiffusion.
Um, and Evren Osarslan, you know, developed a, a scaling relationship, a model where, you know, the length and the time of the diffusion process was described by a fractal uh, process as opposed to a Gaussian one and was able to get all of the displacement uh, distribution data to collapse onto a single master curve with a particular scaling of the displacement profile and the, the, the displacement and the diffusion time. And the reason for doing this is that uh, many changes that occur, particularly in cancer or some other uh, uh, disorders, diseases, may occur at length scales which are far smaller than the voxel length scale and they may cause microstructural tissue rearrangement and this could be for instance a way of uh, providing some indication of microstructural changes in pathology and also uh, could be useful in development. And you can see when this is applied in rat hippocampal tissue, this is from a neuroimaging paper that we wrote, um, that some of these quantities like the fractal dimension that you can extract from these models uh, provide kind of new stains, if you will, for microstructural architectural organization, morphological organization of the tissue, which could potentially be used with the other ones that we've been developing as well. So um, another area that we've been working on is, is looking at, at axonal structure, axon diameter measurements and diameter distribution measurements. Um, this is work that uh, we started with uh, Yaniv Asaf, who's uh, now professor at Tel Aviv University. He was um, a postdoc of mine before that. Um, and it's based on some important findings that are quite old and classical in neurophysiology. This is uh, Ichiji Tosaki and his wife, Nabuko. They used to work in my lab uh, when they were senior citizens. Uh, they both passed away, but uh, one of the many important contributions um, they made was uh, to show that there's a, uh, a linear relationship between the conduction velocity of uh, axons and the, the, their diameter. So this is a, a very interesting scaling relationship. It's one of several well-known kind of classical neurophysiological scaling relationships that uh, you know you can find. It's almost textbook knowledge now. Um, work from Hirsch uh, showed uh, as well that um, axons don't come all in one size, but you can always find the diameter distribution in peripheral nervous system and later Abuitis and others showed it in the central nervous system. So uh, there's a, you know, an obvious question, why, why do nerves, uh, why do axons uh, you know, have different diameters? Uh, you know, presumably you know, you'd want there'd be some optimal where, where there'd be a certain diameter and a certain um, uh, speed and you know, you'd be able to maximize the information. Well, that's not quite how it works. Uh, and in fact, we proposed uh, uh, two years ago uh, a, uh, a optimal principle where we actually solve for the optimal diameter distribution uh, with the idea that we're trying to maximize the uh, information uh, transfer transport along a bundle of axons fixing the number or fixing the total cross-sectional area. So this is a kind of a Lagrangian optimization problem uh, and it produces these heavy tail distributions and if you're interested in, in this you can read about it in, in, this, in this paper but um, one expects based on optimal information transport that you would not have all axons having all the same diameters. So the axon diameter distribution is a, an important neurophysiological property that will tell you something about how quickly information is transported from one part of the brain to another or from the brain to muscles uh, in, and organs in other parts of the body. Um, the idea for doing this really came about by looking at some of the early classical ex experiments in the NMR and porous media field one in particular by Ken Packer. Uh, you know, these are people who were hired by the food industry to look at uh, emulsions, olive oil, cheese, uh, cottage cheese, and all kinds of 
uh, different uh, you know uh, types of, of droplet sizing experiments and uh, th there was a NMR methodology for for sizing spherical droplets and I guess the the key idea that that I had was that axons can be viewed as a cylindrical emulsion if you look at them at the right orientation they have the same properties as a spherical emulsion with a slightly different mathematical pipeline for analyzing them you can go in and use NMR methods to size the distribution of this uh, of, of axons in a pack and fast forward uh, Yaniv and, and uh, Daniel Barazani and colleagues in, in Tel Aviv University uh, developed uh, you know the software and did experiments with uh, live rat brain after doing fairly extensive histological work with uh, sciatic nerve uh, with us at, at NIH um, and showed uh, that the corpus callosum had a very distinctive pattern of diameters of fibers uh, these one, two, three, four, five correspond to these insets here, one, two, three, four, five, where there's a kind of a narrow distribution at both ends of the corpus callosum and a broadening of the distribution in the, in the middle, which is kind of recapitulated by these histological slices. And this down here, th these are the histological data that was analyzed, you know, using J image or image J, uh, you know, uh, so there's fairly good correspondence between these distributions. This one is done non-invasively and in vivo. This is done histologically on excised tissue specimen that's prepared. So um, there are other ways in which we can look at average axon diameter. I think I'm running a little short of time, so, um, but I, I did want to show you that we're, hold on. Maybe we're running much shorter on time. My computer's showing me a spinning wheel now. Um, so uh, another approach that we've been using has been this double PFG or multiple PFG experimental methodology where we can, using smaller gradients with fewer experiments, we can try to back off some of the same information, diameter, diameter distribution, and um, so your concern on gradients is because of the clinical relevance that it's, it's hard to make a very strong gradient. Right. So, so these kinds of uh, experiments could be done on you know existing clinical scanners based on the gradient configurations that are currently available. You have to you know write slightly different sequences, but we've already shown. Uh, Alexandru Avram has shown that we can apply these multiple PFG sequences in vivo. And, um, you know, I'm sorry, but I, I don't think I can advance this right now. But me after start. I, I could. It's just spinning. This is that. Uh, terrifying spinning wheel that everybody is worried about seeing. Um, but if, if I can't get through this, um, this I can kind of summarize and, and uh, let, you, uh, let you ask questions. Um, so, you know, basically we're trying to use this macroscopic imaging information, you know, on the order of m millimeters to drill down into the voxel and get morphological, architectural, microstructural information that really is not, you know, attainable pretty much any other way uh, by sometimes using modeling um, or in some cases, you know, using non-parametric methods. And, you know, we feel that these new stains and new microstructural features will help inform clinical practice but also help us understand, you know, the organization of the brain a little bit better and understanding information transport or transfer between different cortical areas. Um, and obviously being in a development institute, we're interested in traumatic brain injury. That's a key uh, area of concern in our institute. And uh, if it's 
if, if, if things w work out well, maybe we'll find one of these parameters will be very effective in following uh, not only injury to the brain, but possible recovery, you know, with different therapeutic interventions so that we could monitor the outcome of various therapeutic treatments. So I've tried to give you an overview of things that my lab and I are, are doing uh, in this area. You can see that it, it goes well beyond diffusion tensor imaging in scope and specificity, um, but in some ways it's very much an outgrowth of that work. So DTI started off looking at macrostructural, macroscopic processes occurring within the voxel, and a lot of these new methods really go into the voxel at a much finer detail, much more specific, and in some cases much more sensitively to try to pull out new information that really wasn't available before. So my, my you know, my wheel is still spinning, so I'm sorry, I, I can't show you my last slide. There are a lot of people who were involved in this work. I can list them, I know them. Uh, Carla Pierpali and uh, uh, Alexandra Avram, Evren Osarslan, Mickey Komlosh, uh, Dan Benyamini, uh, we have uh, Beth Hutchinson, and there are a number of other, other collaborators too.